Well, hello, my friends. How are we doing this Sunday? Well, yeah. You sound good and you look good. I mean, I'm sorry. If you guys could see what I see right now. You guys, you guys just really upped your game this year. I mean, these sweaters are incredible. I'm just telling you. Well, you, I guess you already know. There was a guy in the first service had a complete suit on. Complete suit with shiny, shiny like shoes. And I was like, yes, yes, thank you. Can I borrow those shoes for the next service? Like, incredible, incredible. Well, um... My name is Jason, and I'm on the team here at Neighborhood. I'm really glad to be here with you. How are things going getting ready for Christmas, y'all? How are we doing? Mm, okay, a little bit. Okay, all right. Well, well I just want to just, as a friend, I just want to say to you, if you still have shopping to do, I just want to say that the season of brotherly shove is in full effect out there. <laughs> so just be careful, all right? I can't tell you the whole story, but let's just say... I probably won't be going back to Costco anytime before Christmas. <laughs> but we'll just leave it at that. Just leave it at that. So um, let's just get a pulse and see how we're doing in our Christmas preparedness, all right? I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, just three. And all you have to do is answer with your thumbs. This means yes. This means no. This means uh, almost, all right? Okay, start with an easy one, your tree. How many of you have your trees up? Do you have your trees up this Christmas? Oh, I, I see a couple thumbs down. So mostly thumbs up, though. Mostly thumbs up. Okay, that's really good. So how about your light, inside and out? Do you have all your lights up that you want? Okay. Okay, lights must be more important. Same people with the thumbs down. Okay. All right, I'm sensing a theme. No problem. All right, and last, of course, but certainly not least, uh, how many of you have bought all your presents, and they're wrapped, and they're ready to go? I'm there, too. I've seen a lot more thumbs down. That's, yeah, yeah, not a problem. One of the things I love about the Christmas season, honestly, is the music, right? I know it isn't the case for everyone. Some of you land more on the other side of the spectrum, this being the other side of the spectrum. I get it. Hey, and listen, no judgment. I just want you to know, I see you. I hear you, Ebenezer. I just, oh, I just said that. No, but listen, seriously, we are in a strange season right now where anywhere we go, Christmas music is the soundtrack of our lives. In the car, right? In the store, in the restaurants, the mall, in the elevator, for heaven's sakes. You can almost not escape it, right? I mean, even we had in our home, we had a, our playlist going, our Christmas playlist, and we left it on the other night, and it was just really soft, and it's just kind of the background of our lives right now. I actually got up in the middle of the night to get something to drink, and I'm just down in this cold thing of water, and I begin to hear this really eerie violin music, and I got scared, y'all. I got scared until I realized uh, it was Silent Night, and I was like, oh, okay, we good, we good, Silent Night. I like that song. It's a good song. I'm safe in my own house. All those kinds of things. But I think, I think the Christmas music that we have going on around us really helps to, I would say, feed the Christmas spirit, so to speak, right? I mean, it's hard to get down when you're, you know, singing songs about the baby Jesus, about joy and peace, goodwill, generosity, right? Friends, all this stuff. It's hard to kind of get down, you know what I mean? I love all those things. But what happens when the soundtrack of this season doesn't match our current circumstances, right? What do we do when our current reality looks and feels very different and maybe even polar opposite than the joy and the peace and the goodwill that we hear sing, sung all around us all the time? What happens then, right? What is there to reach for? Well, I mean, honestly, there's a lot of things you could reach for, but most of those things aren't very good for you. And most of those things aren't going to bring you the ultimate relief that you're looking for. But if I could offer you one thing, one thing that I think would make a significant difference in this season, when you feel like you're barely surviving and you look around and it just seems like everyone else is thriving, I think what I would point you to is hope. <clears throat> hope. As we continue in our series, Reasons for the Seasons, today we are going to focus on hope. Hope is this small word that wears that wear some really big shoes. You know what I mean? But before we jump into the hope of the here and now, I really think, think it makes sense for us to go back to the then and there, right? To the beginnings of hope, right? Its origin story 
if you will. Because on the same night Jesus was born, hope was born. Or maybe another way to say it is hope was reborn and renewed. Because after hundreds of years of praying and waiting for the Messiah to come, the Messiah, the one that who would set everything right, the one God who would send to rescue us in every way, was finally here. And how do we know that he was here? Because upon, because, um, uh, because how do we know? I have no idea. Where am I in my notes here? I was looking down here. How do we know he was here? What was I even talking about, man? Jeez. Talking about hope. Jeez. Here we go. Because after hundreds of years, this stuff happens, right? But how do we know? We know this for a reason. We know this because of the song that was played. We know this because news this big had to have a soundtrack, right? It's like any decent movie that you watch. It has to have a decent soundtrack because even if the, the movie itself or the story itself doesn't move you forward, at least the music will. And so angels deliver an incredible message of, uh, for humanity from its creator, and they sing this song, glory in the highest and on earth Peace, goodwill to men. Now that is a great soundtrack. How many of us would like want that soundtrack over our lives to hear that good news? Of course. But here's the deal. We have to remember that that song didn't quite match up to the current reality of that time either. At that time in history, it was much less merry and bright and way more doom and gloom. I mean, when the angel song drops, yes, it was very exciting for those that heard it and knew exactly what it meant, but for others, it was a bit of a record scratch. You know what I mean? Because at that current reality for them, then and there, was being a conquered people, was being occupied by their enemies. A little, I mean, an incredible, incredible political unrest all around them. And then all of a sudden, this song breaks in out of nowhere. And it's meant to be a notice. Hey, things have changed. But the problem was, as great as the news was, it didn't quite match up to their everyday. Things still seemed the same. They still felt the same. But what we know on the other side of things is that a plan had been put into motion that would change everything. And all they had to do was wait just a little bit longer. And so if you're here today and your circumstances do not yet match the soundtrack of the holiday season, I just want you to know you're not alone. I just want you to know that the same hope that arrived then and there is available to you in the here and now. And if you're here this morning and you would say, no, man, I'm good, man. My hope is at an all-time high. Put me in the game, coach. Well, then to you I would say, it must be nice. Uh, no, no, I'm glad. If your hope is high, that makes me excited. I encourage you to keep on going. But I would also say, lean into today's message as well. Lean in, because if hope has found its way to you, it's meant to be passed through you. Does that make sense? If it's found its way to you, it's meant to be passed through you. So you guys ready to jump in? All right, we're ready or not. Here we go. All right, here we go. So let's start with this whole thing. What is hope? And sometimes the best way to understand something is just to be crystal clear about what it is not, right? We have to start with the understanding that much like Inigo Montoya said in The Princess Bride, you know, you keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. You guys know what I'm talking about when he's talking to, to Vincini, okay? I mean, I could do the accent for you I mean, if I was asked, you know, to do so. Really nice. No, I'm joking. I'm just having some fun. Come on. Just having some fun. Just having some fun. Hey, okay, so, so what was the word? What was the word that, uh, that Vincent kept saying, or Vincini kept saying over and over? Inconceivable, right? He keeps saying it, but then the opposite keeps happening. Hope is a word that gets thrown around and leveraged so often in our culture right now, which is a good thing. It's, it's not a bad thing. But what I mean is to say is that we have to start the conversation recognizing that the, the, hope, the word hope has many different meanings. And we need to be sure that we as believers can identify the difference between what I would call an optimistic hope and a believer's hope. 
Now, we're going to talk more about an optimistic hope in just a moment, but let's jump in and talk about a believer's hope. The writers of the Hebrew Scripture were very much aware and leveraged hope. For them, and helped to describe a state of anticipation that they experience often, and aptly they noted early that it was crucial to human thriving and flourishing. So, of course, it's a very important concept in the Bible. There are several words and meanings they have to describe the word hope. But the one they use most often, and the one I really want to lean into today, is this word. Kava. Can you guys say kava? Kava. Kava. Yeah, it simply means to wait in a state of tension until released with expectation for something to happen. Something's going to happen. And I, I mean, I think our tendency is to just kind of get kind of shallow. This is not the same kind of waiting like, oh my gosh, I have to wait in a long line for Christmas. You know, it's not that. Yes, there is a tension when you're waiting in line. Yes, there is a sense of waiting and all that kind of stuff when you're waiting in line. And yes, if you're anything like me, emotions are high if you're waiting in line, right? But ultimately, you can see the line getting shorter and shorter, right? Ultimately, you can see yourself getting where you ultimately want to be. This is a different kind of waiting and tension about the future. This isn't the same kind that the scriptures talk about. It's more like, it's more like well, when, when somebody is pregnant, all right, pregnant, yeah. So, so when my wife was pregnant with our children, in the months leading up, we just couldn't wait to see them. We couldn't wait for their arrival. Jen really couldn't wait for them to come. You know what I mean? Things were, things were getting there. But here's the thing. You say, well, no, Jason, that's the same. There's a due date. We know it's coming. That's the same kind of hope. No, it's not. You know why? Because you don't know what you're going to get. I'll be honest with you. When I, I was like, oh, I want a boy, I want a boy, I got him a cheesemo, like, come on. The second I found out we were pregnant, do you know what my prayers changed to? Healthy, healthy, healthy. That's all I cared about, because we know. And any of you that are raising teenagers right now, you know, you never know what you're going to get. <laughs> right? Right? So when our first child was born, we kept going back and forth, like, oh, do we want to know if it's going to be a boy or a girl? No, we want to be surprised. No, we want to be prepared, right? So what we decided to do is we, we talked to our, our, our tech, and we were like, hey, we don't want to know. Can you please just put what we're having, you know, what gender it is, in an envelope and give it to us? So we're like, great. Well, that was like a long time. So a lot of time had passed. Then Christmas rolls around. And we have what Jen and I call like our last Christmas together for a long time, right? We kind of celebrated it as just her and I before we brought kids into the world, you know? And it was really sweet, and it was a special time, and it's all done. And I thought, well, we're done, you know? What are we going to do today? And she takes out the envelope. It was in the back of the tree. And like a typical guy, I go, oh, what's that? No, no, I knew exactly what it was. The moment she saw the envelope, she showed me the envelope, I was like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And I opened up that envelope, and it just had one word on it. It just said, boy. And I lost it. I lost it to the point where she's like, are you okay? <laughs> I just began to weep uncontrollably, man. I just began to weep. Because, man, I just... Excuse me. I just want to make sure I'm giving the right thing. I just... I had a rough childhood, you know what I mean? I had a rough childhood, and my father, we had a very strained relationship. And I just felt overwhelmed by the hope of the possibility of being able to be a different kind of father. Does that make sense? Does that make sense to you? See, the believer's hope is about waiting an expectation, right? You find, we find hope all throughout the scriptures, I mean, over 40 times in the Psalms alone, and each time what they are waiting for is God. Because see, biblical hope is based on a person, making it very different than optimistic hope. Hope in the Bible is actually not super optimistic, because this hope in the Bible, it doesn't focus on circumstances, Hopeful people in the Bible often recognize that there is no evidence that things will actually get better. This is how they handled hope. It is God's past faithfulness that motivates our hope for a better future. Do you see the difference? 
It's God's past faithfulness in our lives that paves the way to hope for a better future. We look backwards to look forwards, trusting in nothing but God's character. And the earliest Jesus followers, they cultivated that similar kind of hope, right? Yes, it's still found in God, but also found in Jesus, God's promise fulfilled, God with us. See, a believer's hope looks back to the risen Jesus, and then it looks forward. And here at Neighborhood Church, you know we're a Jesus-centered church, so that's our posture as well. So as you can see, the hope that we claim to and cling to is just a different animal than the kind of hope that's around our culture today. And that can create a problem when we're trying to talk about hope. It can create a problem when we try to convey hope to other people. And honestly, it can trip us up as believers as well. We can begin to think of hope as something that God actually never said it was in the first place, which can leave us feeling, well, hopeless, right? That's why I would go so far to say to you, my friends, that I have a problem with hope, all right? I'm going on the record. I just have a couple of problems with hope. Listen, before you cancel me, all right, get on your socials and be like, oh my goodness, my pastor just said he has a problem with hope. Now he's got a problem with me. You know, don't, you know, calm down. What I mean is, right, hear me out. What I mean is that I have noticed several issues that are commonly, that are common to believers and that trip us up from time to time. Things that have tripped me up at one time or another in my life. And I just would like, what I'd like to do with our remaining time together is using what we just learned um, about hope as a springboard, I want to address three things that, that I really hope that we can become aware of and maybe even avoid in the future so that we can, like Robert H. Schuller said, let our hopes, not our hurts, shape our future. How does that sound to you? You guys with me? All right, awesome. A couple of you are, and that's awesome. Well, just in case I lose some of you along the way, let me tell you what those three things are, and let me tell you the one thing that I hope that you get today. This is the one thing that I hope will last with you long after the holiday season, and it's simply this. Hope may sometimes be hidden, misplaced, or misunderstood, but it is always, it is always, it is always available. We have to remember that. Here's what I mean. There have been times in my life when hope was hidden from me. That is to say, it was wrapped in a package that I didn't recognize, right? There have been times in my life when my hope has been misplaced. That is to say, I put my hope in something that I had no business putting my hope in, and I didn't even realize it, right? There have been times in my life where I have misunderstood hope to the degree where I blamed hope and God and all kinds of other things. But the truth is, is I had a really a misunderstanding of what hope really was. And, and here's what I noticed. The, the, the through line on all those seasons, my friend, is this. Hope was always there. Hope was always there available to me. And I hope that you'll see that today. So let's jump in, but let's start with this idea of hope misunderstood. Three things, just want to throw out there, see, some of you will track with this, I hope. If not, these are three things that have tripped me up in the past about hope. I think hope gets misunderstood as wishful thinking. I think, I think, listen, I think what I would call optimistic hope is like this state of mind that is based on expectation of positive outcomes, period, right? Like whether it's events, circumstances in one's life, or just the world in general, right? Positive outcomes are the point of that kind of optimism, which is great. Sign me up. I want things to work out my way all the time, right? Not a problem, okay? But optimism is about choosing to see every circumstance and how that thing could, could or maybe work out for the best, But this ends up reducing hope to no more than just wishful thinking. I mean, think about it, guys. What happens when the outcomes aren't positive? Do you see the problem? Do you see the problem? Our hope doesn't rest in circumstances, right? We must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. Thank you, Martin Luther King. 
In other words, our circumstances, they can be good, they can be bad, they can be ugly. And yes, these things impact us in the immediate, absolutely. But our ultimate hope is in the one that holds it all together. In the one to, it, it, our hope is in the one who, who has a plan to help us, right? To bless us and not to harm us, right? The one who said that in somehow, in some way, he was going to turn all things out for good in our life, not just the good or positive outcomes. You see, for us, no matter what the circumstances are, we can declare that it is well with our soul. And that's because we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, Hebrews tells us, right? Anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Jesus' followers believe he is the ultimate hope. That's what it says in Romans 8. Right, for, for in this hope we are saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Hope for what they already, who hopes for what they already have? Something to think about. The second misunderstanding I see about hope is this idea as hope as a mere feeling. Hope is a mere feeling. Like, even if you were to look up the definition of, of hope, you would get this, right? You would just, a feeling, right, of expectation and desire for certain things to happen. Or it's a feeling, right, of trust. And that's great. Don't get me wrong. Hope is a great feeling. But the problem is, is that feelings tend to come and go. Even the strongest and the sweetest feelings in this life, they don't last very long. And yet everything I read in the scripture says hope has an extremely long shelf life, right? So it doesn't match. It doesn't add up. <clears throat> Are you beginning to see how this misunderstanding can cause problems with our hope? And if I'm honest, <clears throat> forgive me, <clears throat> I'm struggling with a bit of a cold. And if I'm honest, though, I, I've come to the realization that I can't trust my feelings all the time. You know what I mean? I mean, there have been so many times recently, actually, when what was going on in my mind was not what current reality. It wasn't what was happening in real life. Can anybody relate? Right? Like someone says something and you're like, oh, what they meant is this. And I've got this whole story going. You know what I mean? Listen, I'm almost, I'm older now, okay? Listen. And, and, and I still, I still get this kind of twisted. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I would say over 50 or 60% of the time when I think that I'm mad, or when I think that I'm angry, I have discovered I'm actually hurt. I'm actually hurt. I have hurt feelings because somebody I care about has said something or done something to me. I can't even get that right. I've missed that half the time. Our hope is that quiet confidence in being known by the one who holds us together. Regardless of how you may feel in the moment, everything changes when hope whispers in your ear in your ear, I'm with you. When hope whispers in your ear, this is not the end. This is not the end. And it reminds me that I may not have it all together, I may not know the why or the what, but hope is always available. And the third thing I would say is a misunder common misunderstanding about hope is this, is I think it gets misunderstood as fantasy. You know what I mean? Like, if you just believe hard enough, if you can dream it, you can have it, the, the, that, that somehow hope is founded in, fa founded in fantasy or magic. And the misunderstanding, that is, this misunderstanding has actually tripped a lot of us up, I think, on, the, on our way to hope. When the real truth is, is that our hope is not founded in fantasy. It's actually forged in reality, right? Our hope is not founded in fantasy. It's formed in reality. The hope that we hold to is actually cultivated and formed in us before it will ultimately sustain us. Here's what I mean. Romans 5 says, that, says this, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. There it is. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Now, let's unpack that just a little bit, okay? That first line really bothers me, right? But we also glory in our suffering, right? That's super counterintuitive. That doesn't make any sense. And I wonder, why would he say something like that? But thankfully, I don't have to wonder why because he literally tells us. He says, because. 
He says, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. How do we know this? Life, right? They've lived a little life. They've had a little bit of experience, and they could just see that there's just something about suffering that produces a strength in us, a quiet strength that wasn't there before. This whole idea of perseverance is this persistence in doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. And that perseverance gets cultivated in us, and then it produces character. And I, this isn't the kind of character that's like, he's a good guy, she's a good gal. We're way beyond that, okay? It's the ability to discern God's right way from the wrong way. It's to voluntarily surrender one's own will to do what God wants them to do. To resist the wrong, even under pressure and temptation. That's the kind of character that gets produced in us. And if I'm honest, to me, that's enough, right? Those things, that whole, if all that is happening in our lives, man, that can help me get through a lot in life. But it's not over. It's not over. That, per, that character will eventually produce hope in our lives. And that hope does not put us to shame. It doesn't disappoint. It pulls through all the way to the end, we, we can count on it. Because why? Why can we count on it? Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And here's the thing about love. It always hopes. It always hopes. Don't miss this. Please don't misunderstand this. Please don't get it twisted. Hope is not founded in, founded in fantasy. It's forged in reality. And if you're here today and you would say, oh man, I think I've misunderstood a few things about hope. I just want you to know that you're not alone. And I just want you to remember that yes, hope may sometimes be hidden, misplaced, or even misunderstood. But it's always available to us. All right. All right, let's keep things moving. Okay, so um, another problem I have with hope is that it's easily misplaced, right? It's common and far too easy for us to misplace our hope. And I don't mean like, oh my goodness, I misplaced my car keys and I got to go someplace. That's not what I mean. What I mean is to put your, our hope in a place that it doesn't belong. I mean we misplace our hope when we put our hope in something that promises what it can't actually deliver. Even at Jesus' birth, people had very strong, very strong opinions on what they expected from their Messiah, right? They wanted a conquering king. They wanted a political power, a military force. What they wanted was a fighter. But what they got was a lover. They missed hope because their hope was misplaced. Did you catch that? They missed hope because their hope was misplaced. Place. They misplaced hope in their desire for physical freedom only, which is great, but there was more. They misplaced hope in wanting national freedom. They misplaced hope in a desire for political domination. They weren't looking for spiritual freedom, but that is what they got, and that is what we got. The people of Jesus' day missed the hope wrapped up in Jesus because their hope was misplaced. Even though everything about Jesus, right, everything about Jesus' birth fulfilled the scriptures that they held so dear. And if that's true for them, then and there, come on, guys, you know that's true for us today, right? We misplace our hope all the time, right? When we put our hope in people, put our hope in politics, relationships, power, money, put our hope in looking good, wanting to be right, wanting to seem like we're in control all the time. So that begs the question this morning, and this is kind of where I stop preaching and I start meddling just a little bit, okay? Hey, where have you placed your hope? And that's a great question. And here's what I would do, and I don't always do this, but I'd encourage you to write that down and spend some time this week journaling about that. Asking God to speak to you about this question. And I don't just do that flippantly. I do that because I remember several years ago doing this exact exercise at a spiritual retreat that I was at. And I was completely caught off guard with what happened in the process, right? All I did was just right at the top, where have I been placing my hope, right? And then I prayed and I asked, God, if you will speak, I will write. 
And everything started out just fine. I was easy to name things that I was putting my hope in. And I was like, yes, okay, this makes sense, my bad. You know, and I'm writing, right? I'm writing these things. But really quickly, what I discovered was it moved from hope to just things that just simply had my attention, right? And those things that had my attention, um, they would begin to distract me, right? And they had my focus, right? And I began to see this pattern in my life. I would get distracted by uncertainties in life, about things that were hard in my life. And quite honestly, half of those things were things I had no control over in the first place, right? But but I would look at those things, and they would get my attention. And, And once an issue had my attention, it had my focus, it had me, right? It had me. And every time, fear would rear its ugly head in my life, period. And, that, and the more that, that fear would take root in my heart, the less hopeful I became. I had inadvertently transferred any hope I had for the future right over to fear. Here you go, fear. I'm going to believe in you now. And I didn't even realize it. I had blamed myself. I had blamed hope. At one point, I had even blamed God for the things that were going on in my life. But fear was the one that was pulling the strings all along. Now, now listen, I know that's me, and, and that's my story, but I have to believe that some of you, if not all of you at some level, know what I'm talking about and know what that's like, right? I, I, I say that because as I read the scripture and what we see woven into God's meta-narrative is a phrase that keeps getting repeated over and over again. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And each time that comes up in Scripture, the answer of why you should not be afraid is the exact same every time. Because God is with you. Because God is with you. You shouldn't be afraid. Why not? God is with you. Emmanuel literally means God with us. It's a name given to Jesus. Excuse me. Do you see why hope is so central to the Christmas story and to our lives? It's because fear is the opposite of hope. However, they are kind of like two sides of the same coin. You know what I mean? It's because they both have their, their, um, their hooks in the future that have an impact in the present. All right? Here's what I mean. Let's say that we're flipping a coin. Right? Let's say we're flipping a coin and we say head represents, heads represents hope, tails represents fear. Okay? All right, so here's what you get. You flip the coin, right, and this is what you get. You get heads. Well, here's what, hope, you get hope. Awesome, right? Hope is trusting God about future events in this present moment. You flip that coin again, this time you get fear. I'm sorry about that. Fear is trusting our anxieties about future events in the present moment. And I just have to ask you, which one do you want? Which one do you want to choose? Because both have their their ties. Both hope and fear have their ties in the future, right? But they impact our present moment, our present mindset, our present uh, being and faith about what's next, right? Because because here we are. We say, well, is tomorrow going to be more of the same? Or is tomorrow going to be worse? Or is tomorrow going to get better? And I love the way Bob Goff addresses this. He says this. Fear only has the power that we give it. hey Hope works the same way. Hope is what we'll end up with when fear isn't calling the shots anymore. Can I get an amen? I don't ask for that too much, but I mean, come on. Wow, that is incredible. My friends, if you're here today and like me, you know what it means to misplace your hope. You know what it means to focus so much on fear that it takes the place of hope, I just want you to know you're not alone. And that sometimes, sometimes, God lets us lose hope for a moment so that we'll retrace our steps and find them all over again. And if you're here today in a moment of honesty, you would say, you know what, Jason? I thought I lost my hope, but I'm beginning to think maybe I misplaced it. I thought I lost my hope, but maybe I've just been, I misplaced And you're like, I want it back. And you want to know, what do you have to do to get it back? Here's what I would say to you. I would encourage you, go back to the last place that you saw hope. 
Go back to the last place in your life where you felt hopeful. And I think, you'll, I think you'll find it there again, and I think you'll be able to pick it up. And I think that somehow, in some way, G, the person of Jesus will be a part of that story. Are you starting to feel the gravity just a little bit? The weight that hope carries in our life? You're starting to see why I just wanted to remind us today that hope may sometimes be <coughs> hidden, misplaced, or misunderstood, but it's always, it's always available to us. Hope is a powerful thing. It inspires us to do the impossible, and it helps us to carry on during difficult times. But what do we do if we don't recognize it? Seriously, that brings us to our last problem I have with hope. More accurately, hope, here's what I would say, hope is often hidden. More accurately, it's probably better said, often disguised or shrouded in something else. And sometimes, It's wrapped in difficulty or pain or loss. When Jesus was born, he was born against a backdrop of political unrest, occupation, uh, but with a bunch of rules and laws, and honestly, a system of religion that was leading people to bondage. And it was in the midst of these difficulties that God sends his son. And the baby in the manger is wrapped in humanity, yes. He's wrapped in humility, yes. But he's also wrapped in hope. And I think part of the reason hope was missed, at least at first, was because of the wrapping, right? I mean, it's a baby, right? I mean, it's a small town, right? I mean, it's a common setting, right? Uh, Poor family, right? All that led to the failure to recognize that hope had landed right in their lap, right? He even grew, even when he grew up, he was hidden as a carpenter's son, quiet, ordinary, very much like them. Hope was missed because hope was hidden in unexpected wrappings. And because of that, I just want to remind you, I just want to say to you today that hope comes in many shapes and forms. And as strange as it may be sound, your hope may be, and this may sound, your hope may be wrapped up in a financial difficulty, a strained relationship, or even a habit that you can't seem to quit. Sometimes we ask God for help, and he gives us hope instead. Not because they're different, but because they are the same. Hope may not be the help that you ask for, but it's often exactly what you need most. Okay, I gotta land the plane, running out of time. Hey, listen, this got me thinking of this old song. Um, it's an old Christmas song. Hopefully some of you have heard it at least at one time or another. It's called, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. Right? And it's a, it was originally a poem written by Henry Longfellow that was later made into a song. Okay? Longfellow was known as America's poet. He had a great life, almost an idyllic life for a very long time until one day stra- tragedy struck his family. And with a nation divided by civil war and his family torn apart, Henry puts down his pen, silenced by grief. Come on, we know what that's like sometimes, right? To be silenced by grief and hopelessness. But, in the so- but then the sound of Christmas morning, it reignites the poet's lost voice, dis- and he discovers a resounding hope that's rekindled, that rekindles his faith. He writes this poem seeking to capture the dynamic and the dissonance, the dissonance in his own heart and in the world around him that he saw. And he puts this to pen. He writes this. And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. But then, then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail with peace on earth and goodwill to men. And that is what hope looks like. And how can I stand up here today and say with such confidence that hope is always available? I can say that because Jesus is always available. Jesus never promised that this life would be easy or that things would always go our way and be pain-free. But he did make another promise, that he would never leave us or forsake us. 
We can have hope because our God has a way of always, have, always having something up his sleeve, right? He can even pull hope out of the grave. Whenever we feel like giving up, he doesn't. Even in the darkest circumstances, he's already working to redeem what is lost. This is his nature, this is his character, and this is why we can trust him, and this is why we put our hope in him. Jesus always ha has more hope to give us, to help us not give up. And so as we wrap up, I just want to say, as, as, as you go about your days this Christmas season, I hope you will notice the soundtrack of the music around you. And I hope that even when the soundtrack doesn't quite match up to how you're feeling or how things are going in your life, that you'll remember that hope may sometimes be hidden, misplaced, or even misunderstood, but it's always available, always available. Will you pray with me? God, it's good and right for us to pause just for a moment and say thank you. God, may what happened in here today fill the streets out there tomorrow. In Jesus' name, amen.